Well, that's because of my one day weekend. Um, I'm later posting than usual. I'd listen to some music to calm down because my boss is forcing me to come into work on my day off on Saturday. Potentially, I could be at work for 16 hours. Uh, I bought this today, which is not hockey related, but a very interesting read. So, if you enjoyed the movie, uh, this is well worth the, the nine bucks for it. If you haven't seen the movie yet, don't buy it till you've seen the movie because it doesn't spoil the movie. But if you haven't seen it, it's gonna make you not be surprised by certain things. It doesn't spoil a lot of it, but enough. So I got my Caps jersey on. I wore my Canucks jersey to the new one to work today. I thought, you know what, maybe this will be my good luck charm. Worst day of work ever. So I won't blame the jersey. Uh, I explained on my way out of work. I'm not blaming the jersey for the poor day I had. But I won't be wearing it to work on Saturday. It's not going to happen. Rivalries. So again, uh, I got asked to to number the, the biggest rivalries. This one is mine. And I'm glad it's in the book, because uh, it is the one that is the closest to my heart in the 30 plus years of watch hockey. It's one that uh, made me very angry at the time, and it still does, because the only thing that really makes me angry in hockey is a dirty hit. Um, I defended Brad Marchand as much as I could until the low bridge hit on Sammy Sallow, and I was like, that's it. I can't, I can't defend him anymore. I can't defend that shit. When you watch a player gutlessly try to injure another player, whether it's a knee-on-knee, -knee, it's a low bridge, it's a hip-to-hip -hip that the guy's not expecting, whatever it is, and you can see this guy has it set up in his mind like, I'm taking him out. Like, Rafi Torres is a good example of that. And... From last night's uh, venting on my part, Claude Lemieux uh, certainly raised the ire of a lot of people. But this one, uh, this one is very close to my heart. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read this. It was so intense it could be really scary. Incredible, said Mark Recchi, a witness to several epic battles between his Pittsburgh teammate, defenseman Ol Samuelson, and Cam Neely, the Boston Bruins Hall of Fame bound right winger. I was glad I was watching and not part of it. The rivalry between the six foot one, two hundred and eighteen pound Neely and Samuelson, listed at six foot one, two hundred and five pounds, peaked during the nineteen ninety one Eastern Conference Final, when Neely sustained injuries that eventually led to premature retirement. Postseason intensity wasn't the only reason such all out war was waged, though. Neely and Samuelson were each other's faces and at each other's throats from the moment Neely became a Bruin via a trade with the Vancouver Canucks prior to the 86-87 season. Samuelson, a draftee from Sweden, arrived in Hartford in 84-85 and was bossing me into a physical 162 penalty minutes, competent, plus 28, shutdown defenseman, when Neely came to the Adams Division for eight annual vicious regular season meetings between the New England neighbors. Neely, relatively anonymous over his first three seasons with the Canucks, he wasn't anonymous in Vancouver. Uh, he averaged 17 goals, quickly became synonymous with the term power forward. I honestly think without Neely, I don't know if the term power forward would have become what it was. He definitely redefined power in the NHL. He had great hands around the net and a shot was feared. But he also left teams wary of his tremendous hits on the forecheck, as well as his ability and even eagerness to fight. And he, he hit clean. He hit clean. That's the thing. Just as quickly, Samuelson was the defenseman assigned by the Whalers to try to keep Neely contained. Like few others, Samuelson wasn't afraid to check face-to-face -face or from behind, cross-check, elbow, knee, or punch Neely during ferocious shift in Hartford territory. Neely, by now develop a developing star and fan favorite in Boston and across the NHL, gave back whatever he hadn't dished out and vice versa. I totally understood where Samuelson was coming from and what his job was, said Andy Brickley, who joined Neely in the Bees in 88-89. It was to preoccupy Cam, get him off his game, whatever it took, and no matter how badly his image was marred as a result, he didn't care, he really didn't. As enraged as Neely could become because Samuelson wouldn't fight, he was generally successful against the Whalers in the early years of the rivalry. Most notably, he helped the Bruins survive the temporary absence of Hall of Fame defenseman Ray Bork in the first round playoff series in 90, putting up 
four, six, ten, so four goals, six assists, ten points over seven games, including a game-winning goal in game five. Neely piled up 27 penalty minutes in that series, while Samuelson collected 18. It was a monumental effort for Cam to not get preoccupied with Samuelson, Berkeley said. With that game within a game, those one-on-one -on -one confrontations, it was so hard for him to stay the course and play his game. He had plenty of nights when he did, but some nights he just couldn't. Samuelson's trade to Pittsburgh at the 91 deadline only served to accelerate the battle. The already powerful Penguins, further fortified by ex-Whalers Samuelson and center Ron Francis, met the favored Bruins in the conference final. With the Neely-Samuelson matchup attracting almost as much pre-series attention as that given to the likes of Bork, Mario Lemieux, Coffey, and Yager, Neely scored the Game 1 winner and helped the Bruins take a 2-0 lead in the series. But Pittsburgh charged back to win in six games en route to the first of consecutive Stanley Cups. One of the indelible images of the series is a knee-on-knee -knee hit with which Samuelson upended Neely in open ice. Every series there's something that draws attention, makes it emotional, and that was it in the series, I guess, Samuelson said. I was trying to hit his shoulder, but I guess he moved at the last second and I hit his knee. I wasn't trying to take him out. Neely, however, had actually sustained more significant injuries earlier in the series. While trying to hit Samuelson at a corner, he sustained a thigh injury that led to a condition known as Meositis ossificans, where damaged muscle begins to turn to bone. Uh, and that's what ended his career. Really is. The knees were, were bad, but that his muscle turning to bone, I mean, how do you, how do you play through that? They, they both played on the edge, Brecky said. They were both going to do whatever it took to win a hockey game. On one shift, Cam would get the better of Ulf, and the next, Ulf would get the better of Cam. Neither one of them was going to back down. They drawn a line in the sand, and they were going to go. That's why both teams were where they were at. We were both in the Stanley Cup semis because guys like that were willing to take it to the edge and do whatever it took to win. Confrontations between Neely and Samuelson were rare after 91. Thigh and knee injuries limited Neely to just 22 games over 91, 92, and 92, 93 seasons, and led to hip damage that forced him to retire after 96, 97. Neely and Samuelson never had a bygones be bygones discussion. We haven't talked at all, Samuelson said. Neely no longer discusses the matter, simply saying, my feelings haven't changed. In one of the last interviews in which he addressed the rivalry, the impression is left that Samuelson had been more willing to settle matters with his fists. They only fought twice, with Neely getting instigator penalties both time. Things may not have ended so bitterly. So in other words, if, if Alfie had been willing to fight, Neely would have given him a little more respect. If you're going to hit though if you're going to hit him dirty have the guts to drop your gloves i just didn't respect the way the guy played neely said if you play a certain way you know you're going to upset some people and you've got to be prepared to drop your gloves and go at it and settle your difference differences as things played out each neely versus samuelson meeting was a one-on-one -on -one equivalent of the nhl's oldest most storied rivalries montreal versus boston to see that kind of hatred that was really relegated for us towards the canadians focused on one guy it was so similar brickley said that's one of the things that makes it so memorable. Uh, something I was reading about today, and I meant to mention it yesterday, so I need to mention it today. Uh, Gary Bettman says that there's no scientific link between um, concussions and chronic traumatic encyclopy, I think is how it's pronounced. Basically CTE, which is post-concussion nastiness. For for the NHL right now, they are one of the sports that is dealing with players who played in the league, got concussions, and have had major health problems. Saying, you know, the sports that paid us all these millions of dollars, they knew. The idea behind these lawsuits is, lawsuits is that, that teams, the league, knew the danger. And there's been some attempts, obviously in football, to minimize the publication of said results. Hockey's, it, it's drugs all over again. It's head in the sand. This isn't happening here. Now, I defend Bettman when it comes to relocation or expansion. He has no say in that. That's, that's the Board of Governors. He's, Trump. He's, he's answering whatever they say. He's way off base here. 
you can say, in my opinion, the link between CTE and concussions, I, I don't know. I leave that up to science. But to say, there's no definitive link. I mean, Chris Nowinski answered him right away. Uh, Nowinski, a former WWE uh, wrestler, and it, he had massive concussions in WWE. He wasn't even in there in, in there that long. And wrestling is one of those uh, sports, and it's sport. I don't care if it's predetermined. It's a sport. Those guys take serious risks every night. Between wrestling, football, and hockey, there are head injuries. Um, and, and, and I've had that argument on here with people. And I've had that argument um, at work. I've had that argument with friends. And it's that I enjoy a good hit as much as anybody else. The knee-on-knee -knee between Neely and Samuelson was fucking gutless. For Samuelson to say, I was going for his shoulder and then he moved it. No. <laughs> no, Alfie. You know damn well what you're doing. If, if you lock your knee and the guy you're going at has no clue you're coming in at his knee, you can do serious damage. I've watched it. I've watched guys go flying head over heels. And it is scary to watch. But, and I'll circle back, the head injuries that happen in fighting, so if Alfie dropped his gloves, concussions happen. And Don Cherry's one of the worst for saying nobody gets hurt in a fight. And yet, he'll show a fight and show a guy going to get up after a fight and he kind of falls over. And you see him in these kind of days and his eyes are glossed over. <laughs> He's on Dream Street. He's got a concussion, Don. How many years did we watch fights and laugh? And I laughed at these guys who could barely skate off the ice. Their knees were fine. Their hips were fine. But their brain wasn't fine. Now for the NHL, in, in, the, in the light of Wade Belak, Rick Rippon, Daryl Bugard, John Cordick, uh, Bob Probert, how many guys have to die? And now you've got the, the, the mouthpiece of the NHL coming out and saying, well, there, there could be a link. I don't know, maybe. Are you fucking serious? Of course there's a link. Now, there's, there's two ways he can go with this. Either one, the owners have said, look, you are not going to publicly admit there's a link between concussions and CTE. In which case, you shut the fuck up, and all you say is, there's a court case proceeding, and I don't have, I, I'm not going to make a statement at this time. No comment. Even sitting at, in, in, at a grand jury trial. No comment. But to say, well, the science is, uh, it, it, fucking global warming. Uh, scientists, uh, yeah, there's 2%, 3% of scientists that don't agree, so therefore, you'll say, it's up for debate. Sure. World's flat. It's up for debate. There's people who still think the world's flat, so we're not going to say that it's round. Doesn't matter. And and Bettman, with his statement that there's no there's no link, is insane. And and it is a statement made by a guy who never played hockey. It probably never played football. I would be very surprised if Gary Bettman as a kid played contact sports. Because for him to be so flip about it. Like I think back to when I was a kid. And, and there were times where I was on Dream Street. Sometimes I was playing soccer. And you go up for a header and you clank heads with the kid next to you. And you see stars. And you get up and you kind of have a hard time walking around. Everybody laughs. Did I have a concussion? I never had multiple concussions. These guys have had multiple concussions. This is part of the reason I am completely for and advocating getting the goon out of the game. Not just not not fighting per se. All right. I think if Alf Samuelson throws a dirty hit on you, you have the right to drop your gloves, turn around, and punch him in the fucking mouth. But for the goon who's there just to fight, I don't worry about him hurting Alf Samuelson. I worry about him getting hurt. 
because his only job is to fight. And you look at, you know, guys like Fraser McLaren, Colt Knorr, to some extent Donald Brashear, George LaRock. Good guys. And and Gino Ogic, who's having his health battles right now in Vancouver, and, and the guy's a warrior. Sean Antosky. I mean, you've... Uh, I can't really say... Well, Ronnie Stern fought. He did. He was a bit of a rat, but he fought. Tim Hunter. I mean, you have these guys who fight. And you ask yourself, if these guys fight, say, ten times a year, just ten, they have ten fights in a season. So that's once every eight games. That's about once a month. Let's say they get a concussion in half of the fights. Four. And it can happen. Because you can get a concussion and not realize you've got it. Your head doesn't have to hit the ice. I've seen concussions. I've spent six years doing first aid. Okay. And I've seen people I suspect have had a concussion who didn't strike their head on anything, but they got jarred really badly. So they may have taken some form of an impact and their head got jarred. And it's just that sudden whip. And, and doesn't have to strike anything. Well, what about when that guy takes a punch and his head snaps back? Well, now that your brain, it'll, it'll rattle and it'll, it'll hit the back of your head or the front of your head. You don't know. The NHL right now, and it's like I said, it's, just, it's drugs all over again. Oh, there's no drugs in the NHL. Nope. And right now, it, the NHL will line up its players and go, there's no such thing as steroids in the NHL. Have you seen these guys without their jerseys on? I know they work hard. I know they're the most honest of all the athletes and of all the athletes in the world. Between uh, soccer slash football, for Europeans out there, football, uh, North American football, baseball, there are no more down-to-earth good boys than, than hockey players. All right? I love hockey players. But to say there's no steroids in it is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. These guys are frigging built. And there's somebody, there's somebody in the NHL right now who's well aware that if he's just got that extra five pounds of muscle, he could make an NHL team. And without it, he probably won't. And he may take some kind of an enhancement drug to get there. There's masking agents. There's ways around tests. But because Bettman will sit there and go, we don't have a problem. The NHL doesn't have a problem. Concussions, not a problem. If concussions aren't a problem, why do they have a quiet room? If concussions aren't a problem, why did the NHL start cracking down on them a few years ago? When players started dropping dead, and I really wish I was stretching the truth. I really wish I was saying that and just being dramatic. But why did it take Daryl Bugard, Rick Rippon, for the NHL to go, you know, we might have a problem. We might have a... And at first, it was just that the idea that, that the goon, the enforcer, when his role is over and he's not in the NHL anymore, and because he hasn't made a lot of money, he gets depressed. And we know now that that's not the case. Now, Steve Montador's family is into this as well. And what's, what's eventually going to come out of the woodwork here is the amount of players who've had massive amounts of concussions, especially in the 80s and 90s when they were underdiagnosed, it is going to be problematic. And the NHL is going to cover its ass as all professional sports do. But for Bettman to sit there, and say there's no connection, no science, or very little science, to connect them. It's in its infancy. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not there. And the more that they learn about it, the more they're like, you know, it appears to be, like uh, Chris Benoit was another one. Benoit did a horrible, horrible thing at the end of his life. And there's no forgiving that. But you can't 
just sweep under the rug the fact that this guy had mental problems and that those mental problems could have been added to by concussions he suffered when he was a member of the WWE. Chris Benoit, one of his major moves was a flying headbutt. From the top rope, he landed a headbutt on his opponent's shoulder. And that head connected. Now, if I hit my head on your shoulder while you're down on the mat, it's probably not going to hurt that much. It's going to look spectacular. But man, I'm going to pick up a lot of momentum. And even if my head doesn't hurt that much, I'm probably going to feel a little woozy after. I'll get used to it after the, you know, but how many concussions will I suffer? This is the smoking gun for the NHL. And it's it's one of those things that to me, uh, it, it disgusts me. It disgusts me. Because it reeks of, we'd rather cover our own asses than protect our players. So we'll protect them now, but we'll deny the guys who played before any compensation. Because we're going to tell them what you think exists with CTE and concussions. It's not really there. It's all in your minds. It's not there. The guys we have now, we're going to protect them. Kind of. There have been numerous occasions in hockey games over the last couple years where I've seen a guy get rattled. And I know you guys have seen it too. Guy gets rattled. And you go, that was a nasty hit into the boards. And he was wobbly when he got up. He could have a concussion. And he goes. He skates off the bench. Or he, sk he skates off the ice and, and leaves the bench. Ten minutes later, he's back on the ice. He says he feels fine. I don't give a shit. I don't care. I'm trying to remember, there was a story. It's actually, I think it's on the lighter side of hockey. Which should be totally within reach here. Because it's a funny story, but it, it speaks to exactly what I'm saying here. And I think it's under the Edmonton section. Uh, the Oilers and the Swiss Billionaire, nope. Maybe it's, maybe it's under the Rangers. Trust me, this is a good one. I want to remember who the player was. That it was a, a player. A player got uh, thrown down on the ice, and I think Muckler was the coach. I think I think it was an Oilers comment that I, or an Oilers joke that I saw where the guy's clearly concussed. Doesn't you know where who where, who he is or where he is? And Muckler said, "Tell him he's Gretzky and get him back out there." That's a joke. And that, uh, that shows the difference between then and now. Don't laugh at that now. I don't laugh at concussions. When a guy gets up from a fight or from a hit and he can't skate and he's wobbly, the only time I laugh is when he's, when he's throwing a blade. When one of his skate blades is gone and he tries to skate to the bench, it's one of the funniest things you can watch a player have to struggle with. It is the only time I watch a player skate and I go, I could skate like that with two blades. But the NHL's got to wake up. If they want to be one of the big boys, they've got to take some responsibility. Don't try to be at the head of the class going to Vegas and be behind everybody else when it comes to acknowledging how horrible head injuries are. When you're in a sport that's full contact at full speed, because you can't, you can't say, well, there's no connection. We, our league's safe. Right after you put no-touch icing in to stop guys from getting hit headfirst into the boards, and you put in the quiet room. Because if there isn't a problem, you don't do those two things. Right? Anyways, that's it for now. I will be back uh, again before the end of the day. Fear not. Um, we've passed the 650 subscriber mark. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's a full fist bump. Um, and again, I match, kind of, sort of. This is Washington. It's not the same color scheme, though, so it's kind of clashing. But you get the impression that he's starting to cheer for the Capitals. No, I cheered for these Capitals. These ones in the 80s. The Dennis Marouk 
Capitals, the Rod Langwijk, the Mike Liute Capitals. Those were the guys I cheered for. Mike Gartner back in the day. Dino. Like, there was there were some guys who played in Washington I was a huge fan of. Even Bondra. I really enjoyed Bondra. Bondra was one of the best pure goal scorers I ever saw. So, anyways, um, thanks for watching.